Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome and thank each one of you for coming here today. My name is Aditya Malik. I teach in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Canterbury University. It's an honor for me to be here today and to be able to speak to you, to have this opportunity to speak to you today. The idea for this exhibition arose almost a year ago when my mother visited us from India. My mother had this collection of photographs which her father had taken in the 1940s of Gandhiji. And soon after her, her arrival in Christchurch, she met a colleague of mine, Dorothy, from the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies. And Dorothy suggested that we do something with the photographs. Then Dorothy and my mother met Jane Buckingham from the History Department, and she suggested that we do something with the photographs. And after that, Sarah Kuhlman, a student of Jane's, took me to meet Kate Dews of the Peace Foundation. And Kate, too, said we should do something with the photographs. <laughs> and of course, my mother has been saying I should do something with the negatives for a very long time. So I think I began to get the idea finally. <laughs> and Kate suggested that we apply for a grant from the Peace and Disarmament Education Trust. And the trust has been very generous in offering us two grants to finance this project, for which we're very grateful. What really inspired each one of us to take on this project was not only the historic value and importance of the photographs, the obvious historic value of the photographs, but also the presence of the person that speaks through the photographs. This is a presence that inspires us to reach beyond the resignation and cynicism that faces us every day with regard to our vision of the way we would like our societies, our families, and our personal lives to be. A presence that suggests that there is an alternative for humanity in spite of its overwhelming history of conflict, war, and violence. Many people the world over admire Gandhiji. Many of us see him as an extraordinary human being. But perhaps it could be pointed out here today that he did not have any inherent extraordinary qualities. He did not have an extraordinary education. He didn't study at Canterbury. <laughs> he did not even have an out of the ordinary family background. But what he did have was an extraordinary, almost audacious commitment and vision, namely gaining the independence of India through nonviolent and peaceful means. The point I would like to make here is that the creation or bringing forth of an extraordinary commitment that in turn calls for particular kinds of action is the birthright, if you will, of each and every ordinary human being. Rather than put Gandhiji on a pedestal, as we perhaps do now and then, you and I may want to consider the extraordinary commitment and vision that we can generate as ordinary individuals in our families, communities, workplaces, and nations. The evening today will begin by a recital by John Pani Rao, who is a Maori elder from Taranaki. He will also be saying a few words about the connection between Gandhiji and New Zealand. And after John Pani Rao, I'll be inviting the Vice Chancellor of the University of Canterbury, Professor Daryl Legrew, to address us. Then Kate Dews of the Peace Foundation will talk to us about the declaration of Christchurch as a peace city. And after Kate, my mother, Zareen Malik, will speak to us about her father, D.R.D. Wadia, who took the images. And then finally, the Right Honorable David Longy will address us and inaugurate the exhibition. And after that, Jane Buckingham and I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge all the people who have been involved in this um, wonderful project and also to introduce you to the Canterbury South Asia Trust. So may I now invite John Panirao, please to come to the podium. Nga mehi nui kia koutou, nga mehi hoki ki te tangata kaiwaka aire, ka ore au i tono ingoa, ingoa, ingari, nga mehi tini onui. 
Uh, greetings to you all. I'm just thanked um, our host for introducing me. I'm a, I got a hell of a memory for names, and I, I, I just called him a Tangata Pai, a very good man. <laughs> I am very proud of the people who are in the world. It is an honor now for me to, to as I was <laughs> told, um, to offer a karakia to open this part of the ceremony tonight. The karakia that I want to recite is actually from Taranaki and it was one that was used by Tapuiti, who, as we probably all remember, was a pacifist in his own right. So I'll just go through this karakia, and then I'll tell you a wee bit more about Tapuiti and the connection that uh, perhaps Gandhi had with the same struggle, if you like. So the karakia. When I've completed the karakia, we'll just sing a little waiata, Wakari Amai, just to, to close that part off. Unu here, Unu air, kita po, mua kita po, tapu kita po, waka ur. Wangatu kita tonga, tamanu ui rangi kita tawi, karoko kiri kita mat, koki kiti ora. Kimi ya. Gimme ya, gimme ya. Waiti, waiti, I don't mind the toki. Omi ye, ui ye, taiki ye. And all that meant was, may the light of our ancestors bless the ways of peace and open the pathway to the next world so that we can all walk together hand in hand. And those were the words of the Wheaty. I note that Gandhi was born around about the time that the Wheaty was in the middle of his struggle with the government. The government of the day had promised the new settlers of this land, all the land that they would want. <coughs> they forgot to tell the Māori people about that promise. A treaty had been written, the ink had hardly become dry. The treaty was the basis of trust and understanding. The British didn't trust us and we didn't understand them. And so Tafiti struggled to hold on to his land. And I guess we all know the story about when the, the army went into his pa, that he, they found his whole tribe sitting peacefully in the centre of, the, of their village, waiting patiently for the soldiers to arrive. We all heard the story too, I suppose, about how they had a, a cannon trained on the village of Parihaka. And the threat was that unless the people gave up their village, the cannon would be fired upon them. And of course, during the talk and negotiations, a Maori dog wandered up the hill and he treated the powder in the way that only a dog can. <laughs> <coughs> and so the cannon was never fired. <laughs> Defeaty spent a lot of his time in prison and I find it rather amazing, I suppose, that there are so many photos of Gandhi, but no photos at all of Defiti. Defiti never ever had his photo taken, and I guess it was the old story 
The British were taking so much land from us, no way were they going to take his photo. And so I guess we don't really know what he looks like. Artists have tried to, to, to draw pictures of him from memory. But he spent a lot of time in prison with his, his offsider, Tukukakahi. But a lot of those who stood alongside the Puiti were also my ancestors. And many of them spent their time in prison, some in the caves down in Dunedin. Some had suspended sentences, a bit like the Aussies. Suspended sentences meaning that they were hung. About 10 years ago, the government, or the Governor General, pardoned most of them. It took a long time for them to realise that they were actually wrong, that they should never have been hung. And so we went to Mount Eden and we uplifted their bodies and we had a tangi for them, one that they should have had when it was their time to die. And we buried them at, ha at Parihaka. We took not just the bones, we took the dirt that surrounded them as well. Because that is where the remains had spread out. And so those were sad times for us. The Fiti lost his lands. Parihaka was burnt three times. Each time it was burnt, the Fiti managed to get the people to rebuild it again. But he lost his lands and Taranaki people lost over a million acres. Those that weren't confiscated were forcibly taken, or forcibly bought, I should say. The government of the day paid a, a halfpenny, a half penny per acre for the land. But in their wisdom, I guess we need to be thankful, they did put aside 18,000 acres as a Maori reserve. Unfortunately, they gave the 18,000 acres to the soldiers who attacked Parihaka. And that is really because they could never find that reserve on the maps that they drew. And so to Fuiti, I guess, the struggle wasn't in vain. Because he showed not just Taranaki, but he showed a lot of other Māori tribes throughout the country and taught them to be patient. And that eventually the government and the country would try to make things right again. And I guess this is what's happening now with the treaty and the settlements that the government are now making with my people all over the country. And I only hope that the peoples of India can also have their dreams realised. No reta kia koutou, ko tēnei te mihi, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora no tātou. Oh, waiata, yeah, sorry. Waiata. Wakari a mai. Toi 
Thank you very much. I'd like to call on uh, the Vice Chancellor of Canterbury University. Thank you, Dr. Malik. John Penny Rowe. Dr. Malik. Mrs. Malik. Right Honorable David Lange. Dr. Buckingham. Dr. Dews. Other honored guests. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and for the opportunity for the University of Canterbury to be an integral part of this wonderful exhibition. Gandhi has ex excelled and expressed all of the values that the University of Canterbury also shares with this great community of Christchurch and Canterbury. Dr. Dews will tell you a great deal more about uh, Canterbury as a peace city. I can certainly say that the University of Canterbury is an integral part of that peace city. Our work over the years in peace studies, our work in conflict resolution, international relations, has always been aimed at peace, disarmament, and harmony between all societies. That's what universities have stood for over the years, over the centuries. It's what we will continue to stand for in the new millennium also. Could I say that it's a pleasure for an Australian to be part of the Kiwi dream. If I could refer back to John's comments about the relationship between Pākehā and Māori in this country and reflect in my own experiences in Australia that that great West Island of New Zealand uh, is one of, one of the world's great multicultural societies. It's welcomed people from all over the planet. Maybe a little unwelcoming to refugees at the present time, but if you take it over the past century, then there are some great experiences in Australia along those lines. The great cities of Sydney and Melbourne, Brisbane, Every, all of the great urban centres of Australia are, are now great multicultural centres that exhibit many of the great values that John spoke of. Australia is a multicultural success and a bicultural disaster because there's been no place in that society for Aboriginal Australians. Māori and Pākehā in this country have managed one way or another through the treaty to develop models that even though people in New Zealand feel that they are inadequate, believe me, by international standards, they stand alone. 
they are outstanding indeed. And long may this society continue to develop its biculturalism in that way, because it stands as a great example to the rest of the world. Could I also say that I've admired the way in which New Zealand has been an advocate for peace, an active advocate for peace, on almost every occasion internationally, in all international forums. New Zealand has spoken in the first instance for peace and peaceful solutions to the world's problems. Not only has New Zealand been an advocate for peace, it's been a peacemaker. And I'm sure Kate will tell us more about the potential for Christchurch to be an active, not just advocate for peace, but a genuine maker of peace, bringing together parties, whether they be nations, societies, cultures, groups, organizations, individuals, bringing them, bringing them together in the spirit of reconciliation. And New Zealand is also, I think, renowned as a peacekeeper, having established an environment and a context within which peace can be established to assist those parties actively to maintain and develop a peace. Too often we are simply advocates and not makers and keepers of the great values that we hold dear. So on behalf of the University of Canterbury I thank all of the organisers this evening. I thank all the people of Christchurch for the inspiration that lies behind this. I hope everyone enjoys the exhibition and as I say we're grateful to have been, been a very small part of what is a wonderful gathering tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, Vice Chancellor. May I now invite Kate Hughes of the Christchurch Peace Foundation to speak to all of us. <coughs> Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, greetings to our distinguished guests, who I hope will excuse my back. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> I hope you heard that at the back. He said it's the best part of me. <laughs> On a more serious note, I wish to acknowledge all our ancestors here tonight and all those from India and Pakistan who gather here in spirit with us. It's a great honour to speak, instead of our Mayor, Gary Moore, um, about the recent declaration of Otatahi Christchurch becoming New Zealand's first peace city, 20 years after we became the first nuclear-free city. And our, our people here have a long history of peacemaking. Waitaha and Māori brought with them and applied the principles of Rongo Marairoa, the Māori of peace thereby laying the foundations for peace and the peace heritage we have today. Many small groups of people around our country and in particular in this city have been inspired by the movements led by Te Piti, Gandhi and others. And Christchurch citizens have helped lead many local and national peace groups such as No More War, the Christian Pacifist Society, Bertrand Russell Peace Foundation and others. Many of you may know about Elsie Locke and others who collected over 80,000 signatures for no bombs south of the line and 40 years later we are seeing the creation of a southern hemisphere nuclear free zone. It was Norman Kirk and his government that took France to the world court to try and stop nuclear testing, especially French in the Pacific. In the early 80s local peace groups represented here led the movement for a nuclear-free zone, especially Larry Ross and others. And that resulted in Christchurch being the first nuclear-free city. And later, under David Longy's leadership, New Zealand being the first country in the world to adopt nuclear-free legislation. In, the early in 1986, a small group of New Zealanders led by Harold Evans of Christchurch began the World Court project. And many of you here know that a decade later, the World Court advised that the threat or use 
of, weapons, of nuclear weapons was generally illegal under existing international law. In 1998, Burnham Military Camp hosted peace talks between Papua New Guinea and Bougainville, ending their nine-year conflict. The opening of this exhibition marks the beginning of Peace Week. It's also the United Nations Decade for Peace and Nonviolence for Children. It's wonderful to see so many kids here, including two of my own somewhere. <laughs> Earlier this year, the Mayor of Nagasaki visited Christchurch and the city co-hosted an exhibition of photographs in this museum and over 20,000 people saw them. The time was right for the declaration of Christchurch Otatahi as a peace city and we thank people like David Close and others who in the council uh, helped and supported that idea going through. And Christchurch became a member of the UNESCO Cities for Peace Network. Last month the city endorsed the proposal to establish a peace park, a website, a peace library, to put up peace signs at the airport at last, develop friendship links with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and explore the possibility of a peace museum, peace festivals, and the creation of a conflict resolution centre, building on the success of Bougainville. And it was what you were referring to earlier, that it's a dream of our mayor that we will have a peace city where people in conflict can come to a safe place to talk and try and resolve conflict. And it has been the people of Kashmir at one point who asked us if we could ask our city to do that, that inspired some of us to go and ask the people in our own city and at government level if they could help. As Gandhi said, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. There is an urgent need for the study of peace. And I was most encouraged when I was in New York last week representing our government at the UN study on disarmament education to see two huge articles in the New York Times and I'm going to show them to you because I think they're very significant. They are stories about Gandhi's adopted city. Amen, Amen Dada, Amen Dada. And the terrible violence that there has been there and you can see there's a huge article on that. But luckily the New York Times didn't leave it at that. In the second section it had under arts and ideas to keep the peace study piece and it talked about an Indian academic who's now working with Gandhi Ji's grandson to try and find solutions to uh, the conflicts and the ethnic violence and also he's done a study, a study on how peaceful cities can contribute to that. So I see our city and the statement they've made having a leadership role in our region so we can work with other peace cities around the world and Gandhi's message of non-violence is desperately needed at this point. And we can help by ensuring that this exhibition is shown not just in Christchurch but throughout the city and around the world. And I'm very pleased that NHK Television is here tonight and we hope that in a few, a night next week on Hiroshima Day that some of this message about Gandhi Ji will be filmed in Japan. As Gandhi said, as early as 1938, a small body of determined spirits fired by an unquenchable faith in their mission can alter the course of history. Gandhi showed that he could do it, Tafiti did that with us here, and many small bands have shown in this country that when we join together, we can affect change. So thank you, Gandhi Ji, for your inspiration, which is ongoing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate, for those uh, inspiring and forward-looking words. Um, next, now I invite my mother, Serene Malik, to speak to all of us. Hello, everyone. Is it okay? When I gave my father's Gandhi negatives to my son Aditya last August with the words, Aditya, these are my family heirlooms. More precious than diamonds and gold, they are now yours. 
do something with them. Not in my wildest dreams did I imagine that in such a short while he'd be able to organize this splendid exhibition. It brings tears to my eyes when I think of the affection and care Aditya's friends and colleagues have shown him, a newcomer to this most warm-hearted and invitingly beauteous land, your city with its inspiring name and your wonderful university, alive at the same time with the very old and the very new. I can't find the right words to thank each one of you who have spent hours and hours of your spare time gratuitously in preparing for the culmination of my vague and faint, far away dream of having my father's Gandhi photos shown here in your country. I'm sure after Christchurch, the exhibition will travel to Wellington, Auckland, and other cities of this loving and welcoming land. Not only have Aditya's colleagues shown their warmth of heart and love of freedom and honored the memory of and meaning of Gandhiji's life, struggle, and principles, but I feel honored too that they took up this wish of mine uttered one beautiful sunny day last winter in front of Dorothy and Jane. My father, D.R.G. Wadia, first name Dadi, spelled rather like Daddy, but with one D, was born a Zoroastrian. My mother was Zoroastrian from her father's side and Christian from her German mother's side. She was named Dorothy Fraser at birth. This was later changed to Piroja Wadia on her marriage to my father, but she was affectionately known <coughs> as Pili by her family <coughs> and friends. Photography was my father's greatest love, next to golf. When my mother's interest in politics grew to include men and women involved with our freedom struggle and the Quit India movement of 1942 into her large circle of friends, my father, always on the sidelines of her artistic, literary, humanistic, and political interests, took up his wonderful camera a Leica, I think it was, and shot not only all these photographs you have now seen, but many, many more. Portraits of the common and uncommon man and woman, not only of Gandhiji, <coughs> but of our first Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Mr. Jinnah, first President of Pakistan, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, known as the Frontier Gandhi, Eve Jolio Curie and her husband, daughter and son-in-law of Madame Marie Curie, Pablo Neruda, Chilean poet, Dien Prit, famous British jurist, and many others. Along with these portraits were several landscapes, townscapes, photos of flowers, cacti, animals, and a series of New York skyscrapers of 1945 which my younger son, Sushant, now possesses. All the rest of my father's photographs are housed in the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts in New Delhi. My sister Laila and I were fortunate to have had Gandhiji rest his arms on our young teenage shoulders during his early morning walks on the tableland, part of a set of five plateaus surrounding Panchgadi, a hill resort in Maharashtra. On being questioned by my mother whether my sister and I should be sent abroad, I suppose to England, for further schooling, Gandhiji replied, not just yet. You may send them, if you wish, after their first college degree. In that way, they will have had enough time to get to know, love, and respect their own country. Children sent too early are lost to their motherland. Sound universal advice. I can recall quite vividly a scene 54 years ago of our family sitting on the carpet and on my dad's bed 
glued to the BBC on that fateful day of January the 30th, 1948, when the news radar broadcast to the world the horrifying news of Gandhiji's murder. As he stood up, hands joined in a namaste to greet the crowd gathered for a prayers for meeting, prayers for peace meeting. We were shocked beyond belief. No sounds came from us. And then, all of a sudden, who shot him? We held our breaths, not daring to think of what would have happened to our country had it turned out to be a Muslim. Later, it was with great relief, perplexity, and of course, deep sadness that we learnt it was a Hindu, a Maharashtrian from our very own state. We cried, hugging each other, as if one of our dearest family members had been so harshly taken from our midst. Today, I feel very, very proud of my son, Aditya, that he took this mission upon himself in spite of being such a new member in your society, in spite of having to create all his lectures and seminars in the department, plus looking for a home to live in, the dozens of homes we looked at, the one finally chosen and renovated, with the inspirational and creative advice and hard work put in by Pele, his wife, and the cheerful support of my granddaughters, Renuka and Ambika. I am so grateful to all of you who have helped in making it possible for these photographs to be shown in your city. I'm sure looking at them, not only once, but twice and thrice, will put Gandhiji in your hearts as well. What more could I ask for? Thank you, each and every one of you, for being here this evening. Thank you very much, Mummy. Uh, and I invite David Longy to address us and inaugurate the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you for that welcome. Can I greet uh, those who are gathered with me here? John from Taranaki. Can I greet Dr. Malik and his mum and his wife and the vice chancellor of the university and Kate? And all of you here, and in particular, can I say, Anamana, Anawaka, Anara, Tenakotu, 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 Katoa, to those of you who represent the uh, Tangata Whenua here, and to those of you from Gujarat who are here today. An old friend of mine, Raman Bay, is here, whose family looked after me in Ketwadi Back Road in Bombay 35 years ago, and then up in the villages of Gujarat. And he's been faithful to me all his life, and he's here now, and I'm grateful to see you. And to be here with Lorna, my former personal secretary who has been to India with me several times, and with those people I recognize in the audience who were part of the tradition of peacemaking in Christchurch, it's great to be here. I think it's probably w as well to start where Dr. Malik's mother left off because there is one thing that binds us both, and that is she's probably maybe even slightly older than I am, <laughs> but I have no difficulty remembering the day of which she's just spoken because I heard that on the BBC News and I was five and I always remember my father it's one of the few things that I remember my father saying and he said something which absolutely puzzled me because I had no idea what he meant and he said I hope it wasn't a Muslim I remember years later I asked him what a Muslim was because we were distinctly short of Muslims <laughs> in, in, in South Auckland. We had quite a few Hindus, but Muslims, they were in very, very short supply. <laughs> and I gradually came to understand the dynamics of that situation. And so I remember vividly the passing of that man. 
and his background was very extraordinary. He was born in 1869. He was born in a place called Poor Bandar, up in Gujarat, and that was a place that years later, during the during the resistance, he led the salt march down to the coast, defying the Raj's imposition of taxes on ordinary people's basic requirements. One of my delights in my life was when my daughter was two, I went and took her to see an old man, a Harijan, who was dying, and he had been in jail with Gandhi during those times in Gujarat when the resistance was strong and the strength of those opposing these impositions was very high. And as a very young man, he'd been imprisoned. And my daughter has a photograph with this old warrior for good. And then Gandhi, having gone to school, went off and became a lawyer. He did that by leaving his own country, not according to the advice he gave Dr. Malik's mother, <laughs> but at the first available opportunity. He, uh, <laughs> he didn't go to any of your funny daddy colleges in India. Oh no, he went, off, he went off to the inner temple in London. And there he came and he qualified and he went back to, to uh, live in India and he was not a happy lawyer. He practiced in Bombay, but he found the imposition of the various imposts the touts were charging to give him business was far too extreme. And he went up to Ahmedabad and he earned a living crafting petitions and the like. He did that for an income of about 300 rupees a month, which was very low even in those days. And he played, plied his craft until he received a call to go to South Africa. And he went to South Africa and he had a year's contract there to be involved in some contractual dispute and he was about to return, the better off for having done his stint in South Africa, when there came this movement to disenfranchise Indian citizens in Natal and Gandhi became involved in that movement and out of that arose his first uh, by uh, lateral relationships with the Congress movement. He came back to India and by 1915 he became part of the fabric of the developing nation in terms of the resistance and the hope for peace and independence. There are things about him which are quaint. There are things about his lifestyle which are, were extraordinary even for his time. He was, in a sense, a caricature of himself in some of the things that he did. His appearance was certainly unique. His absolute asceticism was quite unparalleled. And he had the remarkable capacity to endure all sorts of rebuke and ridicule and suffering and regard it as an honor. He flagellated himself with his routine. He would get up at quarter to four in the morning. He would go through rituals and prayers and exercises. Every night he'd sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. He was a person much given to reflection and religious devotion and piety, and yet he was there in the thick of it, and he was there in the black and white of the white heat of Indian revolutionary change. And if you look around these photographs, there's one thing about them which is really marvellous, that they are black and white. There is that quality, the starkness, it's, it's, it's all there. And if you look at the people he was with, my goodness, Jinnah. Fancy having to deal with Jinnah. Jinnah's there, he's on the wall over there, and there is his home in Malabar Hill. The home that this wealthy, autocratic lawyer, the man who had properties in Geneva and London and Paris and around the world, and great wealth, and enough to have this mansion on Malabar Hill in Bombay, was able to have the deals with Gandhi, and Gandhiji never did the deals, never finally agreed, had various solutions, but always intractability on the part of the each in terms of the ultimate outcome prevented them from really reaching an accord. There was, I suppose, a peculiar irony about the place of Gandhi's birth, about six weeks ago, I came down from Delhi on a train to Bombay, and for entirely sentimental reasons, I stood, got off the train at the only stop in Gujarat. It was a place called Baroda. It was four in the morning. The train had eight minutes to stop. It was the Rajstani Express. 
And I got out and I thought about it. And there, this was the state that gave birth to Gandhi, Jinnah. It was the place that had Wallabai Patel, the Mr. Tough Guy, the fix-it man, the, 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 the kneecapper of the, of the sort of first narrow administration, the very, very able administrator. And there was this state where all those actors that became part of the New India were, and yet you could not get more diverse a group of people. And I remember back to the time when I'd been there years before, and I'd been to the ashram at Subramati, where Gandhi established this community, and where I'd seen the spinning wheel and the, and the plain clothing, I'd seen that humble place that he, st he worked at and studied at, and where he conducted his prayer meetings. And I thought of the extraordinary contrast between people, of Jinnah who was autocratic and Gandhi who was selfless. I thought of the fact that when independence did come and at the presidential palace one night, Nehru made that soaring speech about India meeting its destiny and creating for itself a new world and that and the majesty of the presidential palace. And at that time, Gandhi, where was he? He was in the cauldron of conflict. He was over in Calcutta. He was the one who was exposing himself to those terrible conflicts that were there. I thought of India's capacity to erupt and turn on itself, of Allenby killing hundreds of people in that little va valley, in that little alleyway at the back of Amritsar in the First War. I thought of those who were slaughtered on the railways up at Amritsar during the times of partition and that conflagration that could have happened in a huge way over on the western side. And then I thought of Gandhi sleeping away there in the slums of Calcutta while those who had been part of the movement celebrated and reveled in their newfound status. And then I thought of those times when I had sat and been in the places that he'd been and been in Birla House in Albuquerque Road in Delhi and that is the place that Gandhi left to go on his tryst with death. He'd had a busy time, he'd come back from Calcutta, he'd been poorly, he hadn't been at all well, he'd managed to put on a little bit of weight but he'd been on a big fast and he used to go on fast he, he, he and I are different people. <laughs> <laughs> and he would go out of fact. And he was very badly out of condition. And yet people came to him and they worked on him and they, they supplicated and he saw people from the Muslims and he saw various people throughout the day and he was exhausted. And he was late, which is unusual for him because he was a person who was much given to punctuality and order. And then he made his way to the place where the prayer meeting was being held. Birla House from the road is a place which looks like a grand home. It was a grand home. It's one of those strange things about Gandhi. He was, one of his benefactors was the Birla family. Wealthy industrialists, people who were manufacturers of cloths and the like up in Gujarat. And he was the guest in the Birla household, in this lovely mansion, which from the road looks like a distinguished house, but in the back has wonderful lawns and gardens and has a wall with a rock face and a little cascading fountain and is a place of the most extraordinary peace in a rugged city, in a country tumultuous, teeming, absolutely booming with life. Here is this haven, this sanctuary, this place where there is calm, and he was living on the edge of it, down near the garage, and he made his way to the prayer ground, and he was shot dead by three shots, and he died with God's name on his lips. One of the great sad things about life is that his country didn't respond to that challenge. Indians won the right to be inhuman to themselves. 
Pakistanis won the right to be inhuman to each other. And we now have the situation in India where a nuclear noose has been wrapped around the heads of both nations and given the occasional tug to get responses from the self-indulgent and money-flinging international community. And yet, you know, there is in the world that extraordinary desire for peace. There is in the world such a desire that we should never be terrorized nor hold ourselves in the thrall of death or destruction pointlessly and selfishly. There is a need to study the principles which he espoused and to live the life which he led, albeit in different forms and appropriate to our age. One of the good things about an exhibition such as this is that it shows us something of those images which would have been around him at the time and he lived. And one of the good things they do to us is that they give us the chance to make a commitment that we can do what we can to achieve for ourselves and for our brothers and sisters the sort of peace which is worthy of life and that when evil snuffed out the life of a great man, it's not an inevitability that the behavior becomes a matter of repeat and imitation offending, but that there is a prospect that we will develop and that we can construct relationships which are positive and that we have the capacity to love and to be loved. And these are pretty old-fashioned sort of words in a world that we've been living through in New Zealand these last three weeks, haven't you? <laughs> Never heard the word love in the last three weeks, have you? It's a, bit, <laughs> it's a bit rough talking about love in New Zealand when you can talk about something else. But that's the guts of it, and that's why I'm here tonight. And I want to say that uh, I would be surprised if I make many more public appearances, but I'm glad this is the last. extremely honored and most thankful for this extraordinarily inspiring talk that you've given and your address. I think you've really um, come to the heart of the matter that, you know, that all of us have this desire to create a society and live in a society that is worthy of who we are as human beings, of that, of, of peace and satisfaction and cooperation. And I think that that is the desire that all of us have, and that's why all of you are here today, and I want to acknowledge your commitment, everyone's commitment in being here, and that your being here is an expression of that desire as well. And that is a desire that everyone on this planet actually has. 
And in the spirit of that, I would like to, together with my colleague Jane Buckingham, acknowledge the people, our colleagues, and many, many other people who have been involved in this project. Um, and their involvement in this project has also been an expression of their commitment to this desire. So Jane, would you like to come up? And we'd like to have you come up in front so everyone can see you when we acknowledge you. So Jane, would you like to yes, begin with that? I'm afraid, uh, I'm afraid that um, it's going to be my back now. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hate to be two-faced. <laughs> the first people that we really want to thank, both Aditya and I and all of us here, are those who are part of the South Asia seminar and those who formed the Gandhi Committee. So I'll actually ask you to come forward, please. That's Sarah, Dorothy, Ian Katanak. You're supposed to come. Are you here? They're here. Rashmi, Andrew Major, the South Asia Seminar is a group, a group of uh, South Asianists <laughs> who, who uh, came here to. We're, the, we're largely histo historians and members of the Religious Studies Department at the moment, but these are the people who worked like slaves to bring this exhibition to you. So I would like you to publicly acknowledge these people and to thank them for their help. <laughs> we have little presents for you. Do you want to come and grab one? Come on. That's all right. Dorothy provided um, the books for the displays and did work for the labelling. This is the famous Sarah who introduced Kate Jews <laughs> to Aditya. Andrew Major did all the labelling that you see on the photographs. He wrote that stuff and did the large, um, uh, large panels that are part of the exhibition as well and provided expertise by correcting all of us every time we got something wrong when it came to Gandhi. Ian Katnak. In Katnak, who is the who is the granddaddy of them all? <laughs> we this is this is three generations of South Asianists here. I hope you understand. Ian Katnak um, have recently retired from the University of Canterbury. I'm his successor, but Andrew Major was his student, and then it's our students who are part of the next group now coming along, and it's been really wonderful for us to find this renewal of South Asian history and development of South Asian studies, religious studies and culture at the University of Canterbury. So thank you to all those people. <laughs> Rashmi, I'm sorry, Rashmi. Rashmi, you are so quiet. <laughs> Rashmi is the quiet one in our group. <laughs> Rashmi, thank you for providing support and help and things. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> the one South Asian. <laughs> okay. Uh, Aditya will do the next yes. part. Um, I'd like to, uh, to ask Kate Dews, stand up again. That's not too much. Uh, Kate Dews and Liz Tully from Continuing Education and Peter Harper to please come forward, also from Continuing Education. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kate Hughes, of course, has been extremely supportive from right from the beginning of this project, and it was also her idea that we um, apply for a grant from Padet, and I believe she, well, uh, I'm not supposed <laughs> to say anything. She didn't know that. She didn't. She just smiled. Yes. At the when they had a meeting, I suppose. Um, Liz Tully has been extremely supportive. She has extraordinary organizational skills. She's been responsible for the publicity of this exhibition and also for organizing a lecture series that will be held um, in the context of this exhibition. Um, Peter Harper is really the man who you should know, which is why these photographs are hanging here. Peter has spent 
took this on as his retirement project, but I believe he went uh, to the Gold Coast first. <laughs> and when he came back, is that right? Not quite. Not quite, I'm sorry. <laughs> but Peter spent many, many hours actually um, scanning the negatives and cleaning the negatives up to six to eight hours for each of the negatives. And he tells me there's some very good programs at 2 and 3 a.m. in the morning <laughs> on the radio. And um, so it's really been his uh, commitment and uh, engagement in this project that has brought this forward. So thank you, all three of you, very much for being involved in this. And I'd also like to thank our departments, the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, my colleagues and Jane's colleagues in the Department of History. And particularly, we'd like to thank Pauline Wedlake, she's here, Judy Robertson. Could Judy please come forward? She's not here, it's Judy Robertson from the History Department. Rosemary Russell, she's not here. Carol Hiller. You can be quietly there. <laughs> Carol Hiller. You want to say something? No. Hmm? We're just thanking you, Judy, for all the work you did with typing. <laughs> Judy, Judy and uh, Pauline really did all the hard work with putting together our proposals, and Carol was also an enormous support to us, so thank you. Yes. Thank you. We also would like to thank very sincerely the people of the museum, Canterbury Museum, who've given us a home for three months, and particularly Luke Anthony, who's worked extremely hard with a group of people who had no idea what they were doing most of the time, and has done it very patiently, and has produced really a beautiful exhibition. The design, the way he lays things out is, is really lovely and we're very grateful to Luke. Luke is at the back, you can all turn and applaud him. I don't expect him to plunge through the crowd. <laughs> Maureen Downs, of course, has been a great tower of strength to us in um, coordinating and acting as the project manager for the, in terms of the whole exhibition. Uh, we appreciate that very much. And Norton Hillow also helped with editing the labels, so thank you for that. We also have gratitude to express to the University of Canterbury's Design and Print Service, and I don't know if Robin Wilde got here, but Robin and Michelle are responsible for the beautiful uh, images on the posters, and they are available at the back, and they really have lifted the whole design and appearance of the advertising. We're very grateful for that, and they worked under great pressure. Also those who helped from the University of Canterbury's library and the Christchurch City Library who put up displays. And Dorothy was an enormous help in putting this all together. So thank you to those people for all their help. It's amazing what goes into an exhibition. You don't know till you start. <laughs> so we'll thank them. We'd also like to thank very sincerely our sponsors who've supported us in terms of the know how the skills that we simply didn't have. I mean, we had, as Serene said, you know, we had an idea. We didn't know how to do any of it. So that meant we had to find people who knew how to do it. And thankfully, we found people who really didn't just do a job, but took, took the core of the project, took it to heart, and have really put their spirit and soul into it. So we'll thank uh, Ross at Image Lab, who um, printed, brought the images Ford printed them, printed the images that Peter Harper had um, put together for us. Art and Frame, Peter Scott, who provided all the framing. Peace and Disarmament Education Trust, as you know, who helped us with funding and particularly we thank Natu from Ace Video, who's videoing this event for us and is providing us with the video um, support for the exhibition um, that will be on display. And really, it's been a, a place of Christchurch businesses coming to help us and being inspired by the same ideas and commitments that we were inspired by. So we'll thank you all for that. So a round of applause. I'd 
I'd also like to take uh, this opportunity to thank and express our appreciation for the Vice Chancellor of the University of Canterbury and to Sheila Murray. Should I come up, Sheila? Uh, Sheila Murray from the Vice Chancellor's office. The Vice Chancellor has been extremely kind uh, in hosting this inauguration. So thank you for doing this and for being here. I'd like to thank uh, John Panirao for his presence here and for opening the ceremony. Thank you very much for being here. Thank my mother for coming from all the way from India. Thank you. And for giving us the negatives. <laughs> and for being my mother. Finally, of course, I'd like to thank David Longhi. Um, it's uh, just an extraordinary privilege for us to have you here. And uh, I personally have been very moved by what you've said and inspired by what you've said. I'm sure everyone here has been inspired. So I thank you for that. Thank you for bringing inspiration into our lives. And I think the greatest acknowledgement that everyone who's been involved in this exhibition has is, in fact, in the successful launch of this exhibition itself. And it's because of your commitment that the lives of the people who are going to be attending this exhibition will be touched, moved, and inspired in ways that are still unknown and are therefore full of possibility. So I thank you all for being here. Yeah. One more thing to One say to Yes. For those of you who'd like to take something home from this exhibition, and we don't expect you to leave just yet, um, there are some beautiful images available at the back, and you're most welcome to um, make an order, and we'll happily um, send these out to you for a certain sum, of course. Um, but we certainly would like you all to receive um, a little gift before you go, so please don't leave without, without it, as they say. The reason why we're um, offering these gifts is not just because we are deeply appreciative of your being here with us today, but also because you've seen already some of the students who are becoming interested in researching and studying South Asia and becoming more deeply involved and interested in the history and religion and culture of the subcontinent. <coughs> and we really want to be able to support those students more. And one of the things that Aditya and I have done with this exhibition is used it as an opportunity to launch a trust for a research fund to support students and also to support, support academic interchange so that we hope we can bring scholars from overseas to us that we can also go and that to foster um, New Zealand and South Asian relations. So that anything that we, any picture you, you, you decide you'd like to have on your wall, anything, any money you give towards that, any donation that you give towards, towards the, the trust, it's all going into a trust, a South Asia trust, which is there to support not only us but future generations of students and scholars and to keep not only the disciplines alive but also these broader concerns, the memory of Gandhi, his philosophies, his ideas are things which touch students today and they're going to touch students in the next century and we want to help that to continue and to make it a real thing for the next generation of New Zealanders. So this is our opportunity to launch the Canterbury South Asia Trust as well as to launch the exhibition. So thank you very much. Um, everything is in the corner to your behind the um, cameras there and you're most welcome to go and see the images we have for you and to pick up some forms. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I'm telling Carl, I want to go to sleep. It's 11, 11 o'clock in the morning. Good morning, hello. Yeah, yeah, keep going. I'm so, so thinking of this one. Well, it's wonderful. Thank you. I'm Steve Gardner in uh, the legal department.